is 6.09 and the meeting is now started. Uh, this meeting is called to order and the recording may begin. Uh, this meeting of the Economic Development and Employment Committee of Brooklyn County, Brooklyn County Board 2 is called to order and is being recorded for the public access and, and archiving in accordance with the New York State Open Meeting Law. Uh, it is the practice of CB2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee members, cameras on, public attendance, attendees are also encouraged to have their cameras on, particularly if you're given the floor to speak. All attendees, please keep your microphone muted when you're not speaking. To maintain the appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members, board members at large, and then the general public. If you have questions that fall outside of public comment time, please type your questions in the chat panel and we will address them as time permits. Uh, you may also email the district office at any time outside of these meetings. We are committed to providing access for all of our neighbors, regardless, regardless of physical ability or limitations. If you, requ if you require accommodation or assistance for full participation, please contact the district office 20, 72 hours before public meetings. Uh, the committee secretary will now conduct a roll call. Uh, members should speak their name with their cameras on. Hey everyone. All right, we have Chairperson Bill Flanoy, uh, Vice Chair Denise Peterson. I don't see Denise yet. Latrell Masso. I see you, Latrell, on there. I'm uh, here. Ole yeah, I'm here. Wonderful. Oleg Geyser. Oleg, I see you. Kate Yearwood Young. I don't see Kate yet. She's excused absent tonight. She's excused. Okay, wonderful. Jessica Kredgeke. I see you. <laughs> Ron Ronald Cohen. Ronald Cohen was excused also. Okay. Maisha Morales. Maisha, I see you there. Hey. <laughs> uh, Celeste Satin. Cleaning, no. med cleaning to medley. No. Okay, that wraps us up. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Okay. Oh, and by the way, thank you very much. The minutes are as always exquisite. Okay, I just want to make sure. That thank you for those minutes. Okay. Um, no see, I need approval of the agenda. May I get a motion? Okay, is that Morale? Just did, did you give me a motion? Okay. Uh, second, please. I second. Okay. Thank you. I'll give the other trial. Okay. Um, all in favor by ascension. Okay. Let's see now. Uh, let's see now. Did everyone get a chance to read the minutes from uh, April? Okay. Now, uh, I'm sure you all will get a chance to look at the minutes. If there's any corrections or anything that needs to be done, please email the board office. Uh, I will say this, uh, looking at the minutes, I think this is something that's important. The information we got from the bids, I think should be something we archive and have as a resource going forward. Okay, and it was very important that we have all that information. And I thank you very much, Catherine, for actually getting all that down because that's something we can always look back on and see exactly what they need, especially going forward this year as we do uh, these, uh, the district needs. So that's very good. Okay. Um, Today we have two presenters. The first presenter to, uh, that will be given will be End Power by Lisa Lowe. Okay, Lisa, uh, turn it over to you now. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Lowe. I'm the Recruitment and Admissions Manager at End Power Brooklyn, and I'll be presenting today on one of our entry level programs, Tech Fundamentals. Just give me one second while I share my screen. Alrighty. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with our organization, we are a national nonprofit. Um, we're actually 22 years old and Empower was created actually from Microsoft with the, um, the vision to create pathways to economic prosperity by launching digital careers for military veterans and young adults, particularly from underserved communities. 
Um, so we have, as I mentioned, we are a national nonprofit um, here in New York. We do have two locations. Uh, we have our Harlem office in East 105th Street and our Brooklyn, Brooklyn office um, right here in Fort Greene area. Uh, our sister site in Jersey actually um, caters to both of our populations, young adults and veterans. Here in New York, it's just young adults for the moment. Um, and we're also um, located in Missouri, Maryland, Texas, California, and Michigan. So, um, as I mentioned, here in New York, um, as of now, we just serve young adults between the ages of 18 to 25. Uh, the, our starter program is Tech Fundamentals, so that is the program I'll be um, speaking with you all today about. Um, but our once our Tech Fundamentals graduates, um, you know, have completed the program, they do have options for advanced training. Uh, here in New York, we have cyber security or cloud computing. Uh, as at the moment, coding is only available for alumni in the Texas area. So. 80% of our graduates either go on to full-time job placement in an entry-level IT role, or they um, continue on to pursue higher education. And these are just some of the entry-level roles that our students have the competencies for once they complete the Tech Fundamentals program. So titles such as desktop support, IT support analyst, PC technician, network administrator, these are the entry level roles that they are equipped with once they have completed the program. And here in New York, um, the entry, entry level starting salary is around 45,000. So this is our tech fundamentals program in a nutshell. There's two phases. Phase 1 of the program is the technical training. It is 16 weeks long um, Monday through Friday, 9 to 1 or 2 to 6. So it is part time. Plenty of our students are either working part time or in school um, in tandem. Uh, we so for 16 weeks, our students are learning the basics of IT. So what is hardware? What is software? Um, how to troubleshoot? Um, introductory level coding. They are learning the basics. Uh, so computers 101 essentially. Um, and the three certifications that our students um, will ultimately take throughout the course is the CompTIA IT fundamental certification, the CompTIA A plus certification, and new to the curriculum is the Google IT certificate. So at the end of 16 weeks, our students can walk away with three new certifications under their belt. And phase two of the program is a lot more individualized um, based on students' educational background, their work experience, their technical and professional availabilities, um, capabilities, excuse me. Uh, they'll be working with members of our placement team, uh, specifically our internship and career placement manager to find a paid opportunity for them. So um, the, the opportunity could come in terms of an internship. It could come from project-based work, contract roles or direct hire, but we are a workforce program. So essentially we are looking for students that want to get their training, get their certifications and get actually industry experience. Um, so candidates that are looking to work is really ideal for this training program. Um, just some other staff support. Um, we have a full-time social support manager on staff that helps our students uh, during the program and even post-program if they need any resources or referrals. So if there's any housing um, insecurities, food insecurities, uh, technology needs, um, they are the point person to help our, our students with that. Um, Internship career placement manager, as I mentioned, they're working with our students to get them these opportunities, uh, whether it is the internship, a contract role or a full time employment. Either way, all of our students are guaranteed um, some sort of paid opportunity during phase 2 of the program. Uh, and then we also have a dedicated alumni engagement specialist to make sure our students are supported after the program, whether it is uh, more professional training. Uh, whether they want to advance their um, opportunities in with Empower for advanced training programs or whatever that looks like, uh, we do have a dedicated team member for that. We are also very excited to announce a new partnership with CUNY School of Professional Studies. So in addition to the certifications, the three certifications our students obtain within the program, 
uh, that equates to college credits at CUNY SPS. Um, so I won't get into so much detail, but essentially um, students that complete the tech fundamentals program, uh, depending on how, like which certification they get, it's all cumulative, uh, but they can get up to 15 credits at CUNY School of Professional Studies. So as you see here on the chart, each um, certification equates to credits. The ITF uh, equates to three credits specific to this course. Um, CompTIA A+, plus, uh, three credits specific to this course, and the Google IT support actually equates up to 12 credits. Um, and another bonus, if at some point they want to take our cybersecurity program, um, they also get additive credits. So ultimately, they can get up to 27 credits with CUNY SPS completing both programs and getting all um, the certifications offered. So that's another huge bonus. That's something that we're implementing for this fall. Uh, we just solidified our partnership the end of last year. And here are the eligibility requirements. It's pretty straightforward. Our students have to be between the ages of 18 to 25, have their high school diploma or GED, foreign diplomas are acceptable, and they have to be authorized to work in the US, particularly because placement is a requirement, a part of our program. Um, so that is important. Our fall uh, semester starts August 16, uh, 16th. Excuse me. We are currently interviewing and recruiting for that cohort, um, and the application deadline is August 6th. Um, we do run twice a year, so every January and every July. It has been shifted a little bit last year and this year due to the pandemic, but starting spring 2022. We'll be back on regular programming, so every uh, January and every July. And the application process, uh, typically uh, applicants that are interested would attend an info session. It's not mandatory, but we would like them to know fully what they're signing up for. Uh, they would complete an application on our website, empower.org slash apply. Uh, and then they will be contacted by a member of staff to schedule them for a virtual interview. They, it's a two part interview. They meet with myself or any recruitment and admissions manager uh, based on the location they're applying to and also the social support manager um, to assess any needs or resources that, um, that that applicant may need before, during the program. And then they would attend a pre-orientation session. Uh, that's when uh, they'll have the opportunity to meet with the rest of the team and also current students or alumni to get their questions answered. Um, so they are fully prepared of what the program is, um, what it requires and the demand. And they, they're fully um, knowledgeable on what they're signing up for and the vigor of the program, as well as the, the giving the, the opportunity to staff to really meet with these incoming applicants. Well, Lisa, quick question. Sure. Uh, will this uh, virtual uh, application pro process and uh, act will continue after COVID's over? So, as of right now, uh, we know for this fall cohort, we are remaining virtual. There are talks that for spring 2022, we may be hybrid. So, uh, students may, you know, three days uh, can do virtual lessons and two days back in our offices. Uh, but that remains to be seen. We're just, you know, waiting it out like the rest of uh, the world right now. So we're 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 seeing, uh, but at least what we know for sure for this um, upcoming cohort, it will be virtual everything. Okay, I just want to make sure this was standard or just because of COVID. Oh, Thank I'm you. sorry. Um, just because of COVID. Prior to COVID, we were fully in person. Okay. Thank you. No problem. And these are our two locations. Um, you know, doesn't matter so much specifically um, for this cycle because we are virtual, um, but students that have identified any technical needs, uh, they need a computer or a hotspot to complete the program, we do provide our students with that. So they would meet, um, you know, we would schedule a date to meet with them and they'll be meeting us in our offices. And thank you, that was it for the presentation. Um, I, I don't know if I can stop sharing on my end, but I'll, Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> I will um, take any questions or if you want me to wait till the end, however you, you all um, find this best. No, Lisa, thank you very much. I didn't realize we're sure. that close to the end or I would have asked any questions. <laughs> <laughs> I owe it a lot. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, no, that's perfect. Uh, now, let me ask you a question. Now, are there any costs to students as far as enrollment into this program? It is 100% free. Excellent question. It is a free program, uh, but with that, it is very competitive. Our acceptance rate um, is roughly um, 40 to 45%. Um, but we really encourage our students, our applicants rather, to submit their application as early as possible so they have higher chances of getting in. You know, students that are interviewing right now have much higher chances of getting into the program um, based on the seats we have available as opposed to, uh, you know, late July or even August when we really have no seats or we're at full capacity at that point. How many seats do you have available per cohort? So it changes. Um, we're we're growing, we're expanding, and um, but for this uh, this cohort, it will be sixty students. So thirty for the AM uh, class and thirty for the PM. Okay, and this is for Brooklyn or Brooklyn and New York. Uh, this is for um, Brooklyn specifically, Harlem location. Uh, their number is fifty, so twenty five for the AM and twenty five for PM. Okay, thank you. No okay, problem. and. Uh, Okay, the certifications, I believe, are phenomenal. Um, that is, and the fact that also you have the opportunity for work. Now, when you say opportunities for work, what exactly are you, are you what do you mean by that? So, as far we, as... sure, we have over 200 partners just here in New York. So, it varies everywhere from our corporate partners, um, such as like City or KPMG, uh, Bloomberg. Um, down to other nonprofits and schools and just private organizations. So our placement team, you know, in their business development, they have those partnerships and they're always looking for new opportunities. And they're working with our students one on one to identify what is the appropriate opportunity. So say, you know, 18 to 25, they're coming from with um, different backgrounds and different educational backgrounds. So a student straight out of high school, Maybe a full time, you know, full time direct hire opportunity wouldn't be ideal. They need to develop a little bit more work experience and professional coaching. Uh, we would likely put them in an internship role. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have partnerships with the DOE where they're looking for, you know, interns for maybe 10 weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that would be an opportunity that we um, express to the students, see if that's a good fit and they would interview. Of course, they have to interview um, and, mm -hmm. you know, get accepted. Uh, so that might, that's just one scenario. And then we have, you know, plenty of students that have their degrees or just some college, college experience. Um, and they are maybe more advanced for a direct hire role or maybe these long term contract roles. So it really just depends on that student's background. Uh, prior to um, prior to COVID, we were a, really a one size fits all program. It was 16 weeks in in person training and a guaranteed seven week paid internship, regardless of your background. And then um, and then uh, they would work with our career placement managers to look for job opportunities. But due to COVID, we had to get creative and pivot, and we found that this model actually works a little bit better because we have students of diverse backgrounds in terms of education um, and work history. So um, that one size fits all model is no longer; it's now more catered to the students, um, the students' background. Okay, thank you. I have more questions, but I'm gonna let the committee members actually, uh, actually, an opportunity to ask questions. <laughs> <also>. <laughs> Okay, any of the uh, committee members have questions? Okay, yes. Okay, Catherine. Just a question. Uh, thank you, by the way, Lisa, for your, your presentation. Um, just a question about how you reach the community and what kind of relationships you have either with high schools or local colleges in our area. Um, and kind of what your, what your guys strategy is on letting, letting those young people know about this program. Sure. So. We um, just uh, like we have our partners when it comes to placing our students um, for business development. We do have it's part of my role is the recruitment outreach. So similar to what um, how I'm here today, reached out to you know different community boards um, in New York. Hey, we exist, um, or maybe we worked together in the past, but the relationship has like fizzled at some point. 
um, just like, you know, letting them know that the program is this, so we're still operating, we're, you know, we're virtual now, um, you know, this is the services that we offer, how can we, you know, share this with the community? So that that's exactly how I got connected today. We, we do have um, plenty of relationships with other community boards. This is new, at least on my end, I've been uh, with NPower for a little bit over two and a half years. Um, we have a relationships with the DOE of especially high schools, right? But since that is our population, all of the CUNY colleges and um, news new to us is the SUNY really getting that relationship on board. And of course, private colleges, um, but really that is our, our marketing strategy um, is our high schools, our community boards, of course, other community partners that offer similar um, programs, other technical training programs, because we always, if since we do have a smaller acceptance rate, right, 40 to 45 percent, if we do decline a seat to an applicant, we always like to give them an additional resource of what else might be suited for them. So if that's one of our competitors, we're happy to send them that referral um, just so, you know, these young people are connected to something and they're not left hanging. Okay. Yes, Ms. Pearson. Hi, good evening, everyone. I apologize for my lateness onto this onto this uh, meeting. Um, I just wanted to, uh, that was an excellent question, Catherine, because um, I'm always into outreach courses. You can have the greatest program in the world, but if nobody knows about it but you, then it's like you're not have, you don't have a program. And so, uh, and this, this, the success of such programs are measured by those who are in it and come out successful in the end. So that's great. Lisa, I just wanted to ask a question. Are you connected to uh, uh, Roger Green by chance with your program? I'm not familiar with okay. the organization with the or okay. school. Okay, all right, thanks. No problem. Okay. Okay, question? Yes, okay. Lindsay? Um, so as, aside from just singing your praises, how are some ways that the community board can continue to support you and your program? Oh, that's a great question. This is the huge start, right? It's for you all to know um, that we exist, the services that we offer. But however you interact um, in your specific role with um, the community at large, we host info sessions. We are very creative when it comes to outreach. So we are more than happy to collaborate on any um, events that you have upcoming, whatever that may look like, creating um, specific NPower and Community Board 2 branded material. Uh, we get creative. So it's just having that one-off conversation. What does your role look like and how you interact with the community? And let's brainstorm ways to like, you know, spread our message and that we're, you know, collaborating. That's really great to hear. I know Ms. Peterson has been working really hard on um, a jobs fair. And so maybe when that comes about, we could send you some information. And um, also when you have sessions that you're trying to promote, if you make sure to send them to the board office, we, we do a lot of work to, to make announcements and a lot of us amplify on our own personal social media pages. Um, to get the work out to our, um, as well as Tay has been working really hard on, on the community board having our own page. Um, and so if you continue to send us information when you're having events, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us will make sure to be amplifying that for you. Thank you for that. I will definitely will do because we have an, um, an event next month actually demystifying women in tech where we're going to be reaching out to different women tech influencers um, and just some women that we've worked with in the past that were guest speakers to our students um, representing different areas in tech. So software development, coding, IT, um, and really catering to that female market that is very, um, it, it, it's very slim in um, the technology space. So we just wanted to amplify their voices. So that's the next event that we're um, working on. So I will definitely send you the details when we have the event right um, and all the panelists listed. Okay, I think Lisa, Thank you so much. No problem. <laughs> Lisa, I take it that's the 4022 event? Uh um, no, that's not the 40 by 22 event, but that is, um, that is an initiative that we have with city. 
um, that by the year of 2022, 40% of our staff will be females and 40% specifically our students would be females of color. Okay, I'm glad I brought that up. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure what that was. Okay, now let me ask you a question. You also have a mentor program. Uh, how does that work? Yes, that's um, very new. That's uh, uh, a few months old because that's implemented um, as of this cohort, our spring 2021 cohort. So um, some of our older alumni and our partners, um, they have volunteered their time to mentor our students individually. So each of our students all have um, a mentor, not necessarily in IT, just someone that has a wealth of knowledge and work experience that can help them with their professional professionalism and just life advice overall like life mentor life coach um so that's something that we that we newly implemented and you know uh it's been very gracious and i think it speaks to our partners uh that they want to volunteer we actually had more volunteers than we had students so um it, it definitely speaks to the work that we do and how involved our partners actually are um, with our program and seeing the success of it yes Go on. Um, so do you ever bring in speakers also? I just, you're jogging something. I, there are a couple of folks that work, I, so I work for the city and there are a couple of folks that um, work in our IT department that might be interested in talking about their career path and, and bringing some of their knowledge. Um, and it's a really diverse group of folks and I think that they might be inspiring um, to, to the folks that you're working with. Absolutely. I would love to connect um, because we have a robust professional development calendar and that's dedicated. That's actually built into our curriculum. So, Monday through Wednesday are is the IT training Thursday specifically our professional development days where we would either have guest lectures or members of the staff um, are delivering on a topic, whether it's how to write a technical resume, how to write a cover letter. Um, creating your LinkedIn profile that's dedicated on um, Thursdays. That's PD days are on Thursdays and Fridays are like tutoring and self directed study days. So we, we love to have guest lecturers come in because our students are interested in different areas of tech. This is just the starting point. Um, so we always love encourage, you know, guest speakers to come in and just share their career trajectories um, and just expand our students minds and the, their, you know, the opportunities out there. Um, so we can definitely connect about that. Um, I, I know our calendar is full for this um, this cohort, our spring session, but for fall, you know, we're still looking for um, guest speakers. So definitely love to continue that conversation offline. Perfect. Now, another question I have for you is, um, you're also asking for funding, like donations. Are you getting donations from your alumni or where else you're looking for funds coming in? Yeah, um, thank news to us. Um, we were granted a 2 million dollar PPP loan from the state. So that was great. Um, I think a small amount of our funding does come from alumni or just angel funding. Uh, but a lot of it is from our, our, our partners, our business partners in terms of placement. Um, that they, they, they fund the program in that way, because they know the mission and they know the talent that um, comes through empower and they want that at the end <laughs> to work for their organization and not have to look or hire a staffing agency. So it, it's like, a you know, it's, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. But most of our funding, the majority of it is from uh, our partners that we're placing students at. Okay, now the final question I have right now is, uh, as far as your other uh, alumnus, uh, what exactly, how many people have you actually graduated? Um, I can speak for Brooklyn, uh, excuse me, New York confidently. Um, to date, it has been a little bit over 3,200 students. 3,200? Yes. Okay, in 22 years? Yes. We've expanded. We didn't start off this big. The first cohort was about like 15 students. Okay. And what do you expect going forward after we come out of COVID? We're already talking expansion um, and spring 2020. Um, it's looking like it will, the program will change again. It may adopt 
into a new model and giving the students the option to pick which pathway they want to go on in terms of certification and how long the program will look. Um, I don't want to speak prematurely, but um, because that's not formalized yet, uh, mm -hmm. but that is the conversation that's happening, at least on the leadership level. Um, where spring, uh, we will be able to take in more students um, and, you know, have more students come through our doors by giving, um, making the program time shorter. So maybe instead of 16 weeks, it's eight weeks. And you can either choose, you know, to just take your ITF in eight weeks, take, do the A plus in eight weeks, um, and the Google IT certificate that will be combined, um, and then another component of just professional development coaching for those are that that are not ready really to enter the workforce and need a, a little bit more hands-on support. Uh, so a lot of changes to come. Uh, don't want to speak so much on it until it is formalized, but. Uh, we are expanding and we're just getting creative and in ways to reach more young people in the community. Okay. Uh, any more questions for the committee? I have a question. This is Latrell. Do you have like one success story that stands out to you that you would like to share with us? Yeah, I definitely would. Um, most recently, because she just graduated um, last cycle. Uh, our, our graduate Kayla, I won't give the last name, but Kayla, she interviewed with us while she was still in high school, uh, Chelsea Career Technical High School in the city. Um, she said, you know, I, I know for sure I'm not going straight away into college. Um, her mom was already working um, in a, the tech field, and she said, I, I know it's better for me to get some experience before I go to school, get a degree, and then I can't get hired because I have no experience. I want to get some more experience under my belt um, and certifications to prove, like, to be more marketable in the, the workforce. Uh, so she was clearly, you know, demonstrating uh, for someone her age that was 18 how passionate she was, how driven she was, and just self-motivated. She knew what she wanted to do. Um, she was able to articulate that very well. And um, we accepted her into the program. She did phenomenal from day one, took all the advice, the coaching support, always um, you know, asked for each staff member to schedule one-on-ones to see where she can improve. Um, so she stood out to us a lot, and she was one of the students that we recommended for the city apprenticeship, apprenticeship um, for their IT intern. And so they took six of our students, but she particularly stands out because she's 18. This was like her first you know, real job. Um, for so she was an I she, currently she's still working there, but an IT um, apprentice internship for six months with City, making eighty thousand dollars. So eighty thousand dollars in six months for an eighteen-year-old is a lot of money. It's a lot of money for any of us on the call, but <laughs> for an eighteen-year-old, um, I, I, you know, I'm like, you have to pay it forward. So if I ask you to come to speak to any any events that we have, I don't want to hear no or I'm unavailable. Don't get too big for end power. But um, yes, because that just happened most recently, and it, it's beautiful to see um, that our students. Our, our students are, um, they're, they're putting in the work and they're reaping the benefits from their work. It's not all us. It's of course, whatever you put in is what you get out. And she's a prime example of that. Thank you. Yeah, that is a success story. Yes, that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, hopefully we'll keep in touch. Could you do me a favor, please? Uh, in the chat, could you put your, uh, information, your sure. website, and also application admissions so that Absolutely. we have it. Okay, thank you thank so you. much for having me. No, thank you for the presentation. It was a beautiful presentation and we'll be in touch with you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next present presentation, okay, is for the Trellis Youth uh, Crew and uh, Pastor Zach Martin, the floor is yours. Thanks everybody. It's hard to follow that. My presentation is nowhere near as organized, but we're nowhere near as old. So I'm um, still a work in progress. Uh, so yeah, I'm Zach Martin, uh, pastor um, of justice and mercy at recovery house of worship. Also the executive director of trellis, a community development nonprofit. Building collaborations to address neighborhood injustice. We work in the Gowanus, Bedsty, crown heights and Fort green. 
um, focusing on and centering on uh, public housing students. So we work with students 14 to 18. Um, and so it's a, it's a beautiful opportunity. Um, again, the idea behind Trellis is again, um, it's all about access and advocacy. So many folks just don't have access to the opportunities that are even in their own backyard. And so raising awareness about how the access is necessary specifically for young people. Um, there's a lot of other corollary things I could mention related, um, you know, work um, national organizations that are not abiding by, uh, you know, state standards for employing youth. So 14 year olds in, in New York City, for example, are are qualified to work in certain settings, 15 year olds, 16 year olds. Most national organizations working in New York State won't hire um, any anyone under the age of 18, which in fact is discriminatory, but that's a separate conversation. Um, so what we do is partner with organizations in the community to provide paid community service opportunities for students um, working with mutual aid groups. So I'm going to give you a bit of background and I'll put my presentation up just to give some more details. Um, so we partner with mutual aid groups, uh, Gowanus Mutual Aid, Clinton Hill, Fort Greene Mutual Aid, uh, bed Mutual Aid, and we, we pay the students to participate in the work that's happening in food, largely food distribution right now in those neighborhoods, uh, realizing that jobs are very difficult to come by, as I've already mentioned, for students, particularly students of color. And so um, I don't have, actually, just as an example, I don't have a white student that I'm working with right now. So I'm, I'm a obvious minority in the, in the students in the, that I'm supporting and serving and learning from through the program. Um, so then we and then we help advocate. What, why aren't those students being provided opportunities? What what are the situations that need to change that provide them access and opportunity? We also uh, raise up um, and maybe I'll do the presentation now because it goes into some of the things that we're doing and you can see some of their beautiful work. So just, just give me one second here. Go there and then go here. Go share. I'm back. I get rid of this. Sorry, you can see my emails. There we go. Um, oh. See that either. There we go. So this is um, the, the trellis crew as affectionately known. Can everyone see that? Zoom in a little more. Um, so the trellis crew is a collection of students, um, largely public housing students. Again, the strength of the work over the last few years has been working with um, Ingersoll and Whitman in Fort Greene. Um, so it's uh, students that are again being provided opportunities to do one of a couple of things. One again, I already said community service opportunities in their neighborhood. Um, you might see a familiar face if you're on um, in the economic development group uh, specifically, um, but that's Celeste Staten on the far right, working with one of my students, Shasena, and uh, she was helping with distributing a PPP, uh, a whole bunch of stuff, PPE stuff, um, doing uh, just community checks at the Atlantic Terminal. So our, we we paid her to support Celeste in doing that work in the at the Atlantic Terminal because Celeste does incredible work in supporting her residents at the Atlantic Terminal. In the center is Veronica. So Veronica helps um, with food distribution at the Ingersoll Community Center, as well as some work that happens in bed -Stuy. So every Friday she helps pack and then distribute uh, food that happened in her neighborhood. Um, that's a great work that she's doing. And then below, so the second component of the work is we recognize that students need to be um, heard and seen in communities. This has been incredibly difficult in the midst of COVID because many of the community meetings remain online. And so even technological access for many of these students, having to share a computer, not having internet access at home, a bunch of limitations. We, we've worked really hard to make sure that they can ac access opportunities to hear what's going on in the neighborhood and then participate in what's going on. So what we do is um, we let the students know about opportunities, community board meetings, community education council meetings, precinct meetings, PTA meetings, elected official meetings, mayor, all these other events. They attend those events, are encouraged to participate by speaking up in those spaces, and then they write a report about what they're learning from that space, particularly as it relates to um, their youth voice. So how did they you know, understand what was being communicated. Do they feel like they were welcome? Do they feel like their insights were welcome? How does what is being communicated impact or support their communities? So those are a couple of the reports. These are all up on our website and the students are paid um, to provide those opportunities. So there's stipend to provide um, these reports. So um, this one's a recent one on, on racism and the, the, what's ha what, what had been happening um, sort of early in the pandemic um, before the administration change um, at the White House, 
And then the reaction to the George Floyd uh, death, uh, a couple of students wrote reports on their, their perspective and their opinion, their feelings about that. Um, so that's the second component of what we do is making sure these students have access. So they're going to Zoom meetings largely, um, and then they're reporting on them. And then those uh, reports are being put out onto our website um, so that the people can read about them. We're encouraging those students to remember that um, their voice matters, right? Their perspective matters and it's necessary um, as we think about what's happening in our communities. And then the last part of it is providing employment, uh, placement and career mentorship opportunities for these students. And so this can happen in a number of ways. So whether that's um, being employed by a local business, um, we, we've, we've seen local businesses do that um, in Gowanus, in, in Park Slope, in, in Fort Greene. A great example of this was um, unfortunately one of the businesses that didn't make it through the pandemic, uh, but one of my friends ra ran a coffee shop called Regular Visitors, which was on Smith Street and Bergen. And uh, it, they, they, she hired two of my students. One of them was a 14 year old. So they actually stipend her, provided her opportunity to do like um, inventory management and things where it wasn't, you know, it was just like supportive work. They ended up hiring her. She worked there for two years, allowed her to save for college. She's now at uh, Oswego um, up in upstate, one of the CUNY SUNY schools upstate now. And she's on this like, student council there doing incredibly well. Um, but that all started with a local business providing an opportunity, sort of a, a, an infrequent, but a purposeful opportunity. And so for some, it's that you, maybe some, some of these businesses can hire students, right? But we know all know that jobs are very difficult to come by in terms of, you know, limited access, limited opportunities, but related, what we're trying to do is inspire businesses to think about, we work with bids specifically. So we're, uh, we're built building relationships with a number of other bids, but Fab and um, North Flatbush and um, the Court Street Smith bid that's it's coming together. Um, building, trying to build relationships with the downtown bid, trying to build relationships with the Montague bid, um, other one, others that I probably overlooked. But recognizing there's the open streets and there's the um, all these other things where manpower is necessary to make events happen, right? So. Um, we work with with uh, these bids and small businesses to say, if, if a weekend event is happening, how could you provide su a supervisor to provide opportunity for the students? We will pay. I mean, you can pay if you have the finances, but we raise money to be able to pay these students an hourly wage to support the work. Because again, connected, we believe that these students participating in these community events, two things are happening. One, they know that they're welcome in these spaces to contribute what's happening in the community, to strengthen and support whatever initiative, whatever event, whatever things are happening in the community. Secondly, it's also connecting them with small businesses and other people that are in the community so that when they become of age to work full time and, and take on these capacities, that these small business owners and community members are seeing that they're valuable, necessary components of society. They're already doing that, but it's a visible way for the, the rest of the community to see that they're they're doing the work. Um, and then lastly, again, it's just recognizing that what we're trying to unapologetically do is help these students be good citizens. So what does it mean for them to participate and support what's happening in the community? So again, um, we encourage small businesses, we encourage bids to think about, as you think about your calendar, think about, okay, well, I'm going to be reopening my, my business and I need help with all the paperwork related to these things. And I don't, I can't hire someone full time or I can't hire, I just need filing paperwork. I need an, two hours or three hours or four hours. What would it look like to have a student just helping you sort paperwork? Or you're gonna build out this outdoor space and you can help, you know, a student can help just setting up chairs or watering plants or I mean, whatever those things are to think creatively about how we can support these students in providing access to opportunity in these neighborhoods because um, again, jobs are few and far between. Uh, chains are, you know, obviously just entering in. They're the ones that are succeeding, unfortunately, in the midst of this economy. Um, and they often are not the ones that are going to be hiring 16 year olds in the community, even though legally they have access to pretty much every opportunity that everyone else had, minus, you know, maybe not being able to close the shop. Um, so those kind of things. So um, again, the goal is through these opportunities. Um, to help these students be, be, be you know, value, remind the community that these students are valuable, important, necessary components of the community. Um, they can contribute, they can support, they can participate in what's happening. So um, we've seen success. We have students now in college 
who started with the program, uh, two of them going to John Jay, one of them changed their, their major to take on criminal law because we do a lot of advocacy things around police reform and other things, but he was involved in a mem mentorship group happening in the Bronx, um, changed his major because he just became so passionate about what, what was going on and what he heard about um, in the community. Um, we've had, you know, others who are in college, um, just thriving, succeeding because, and, and what, and we all know, right? We all know, I love end power and I love what they're doing. And we're definitely going to connect because once my students graduate better, the program, they're going to need uh, full time work opportunities. And I'm glad to make sure we talk and connect the dots there. Um, but we know that most employers are looking for well rounded citizens. They don't want to just know that you can crunch numbers. They want to know, are you a good human? Right? Are you have you contributed to helping your community? Have you been, a, you know, a support to your family? All right, tell me about your extracurricular activities. Tell me about what other things you've done, because that separates folks. I mean, if it's just looking at a resume and if it's just about the data, they're going to start to look at some of the other things. And so we believe we're helping these students fill out their life. What other things can they contribute um, to in society? What other things can they take on that helps them just be well rounded? You know, good humans that prepares them for the future to participate in what's happening in and around them. So that's a bit about the work. Um, I'll take any questions. I think I can stop my screen share now. So. Okay, yeah. thank you, uh, Zach. I appreciate that. Uh, that was a good presentation. A um, couple quick questions here. Yeah. Um, now, you said basically, I noticed that you have a blog on your site. Yeah. Okay, now that's, that's where the students post to your yep. blog. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, also on our Instagram page, our Insta we have an Instagram specifically for the Trellis group that's managed by the students. So everything that winds up on there is managed by the students. So, that's, so everything's managed by the students. Yep. Yeah, I'm not. Okay. I'm, in terms of the reports that they end up, very little editing is happening. They're just submitting it, and I'm just posting it. So. Okay. Now, yep. as far as partnerships and financing, mm -hmm. okay, where are you getting your financing from? Are you getting it from your partners, or what's the story with that? Yeah, so uh, it's scratching coins, um, but you know it's uh, little little grants here and there. Um, we've worked in the past with the city. The city has a safe, uh, I think it's called safe safe streets or safe in the city grant. Um, and what we do is, you know, I'm an, uh, a community activist and organizer, and so I, I, I leverage a lot of the grants, smaller grants, that make it possible by saying what we want to do is, you know, just putting it. Plainly, I'd rather keep the students busy by doing the productive things so they don't get caught up in unproductive and, 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 you know, destructive things. So I can angle a lot of those kinds of smaller grants. So there's some of those grants that happen. We're applying for larger grants now because I'm going to, we're reaching, we're serving about 30 students relationally, very heavily relationally, because we do just support them, mentor them, care for them through whatever's going on in their life. So we have to build up staff. Um, add mentors and things, things like that. So there'll be some larger grants. Brooklyn Community Foundation. We're applying through a fiscal sponsor to do um, some add, to add some benefit and some to build out some of the stuff. And then just individual donors who believe. You know, last year we uh, added 20 students for the summer program. Um, had a, you know 15 students working in two different public housing residences, and that was funded by like 10 individuals who just believed in the work and contributed to make it happen. So. Okay, one of the things you mentioned, and I wanted to bring it up also, is the mentoring. Okay, how are you doing with the mentoring? Who do you do the outreach to? And how does it actually work? Because I noticed that uh, I believe most of your students are coming, or most of your uh, uh, children are coming from the uh, North Brooklyn and the public housing. So yep. how how do mentors get involved with them? Yeah, so um, what, what I believe, again, in terms of what we're doing right now is um, we I, I want the students to hear from those one, I believe heavily in representation. So because I'm a white man caring for a lot of black and brown students at, at pretty much every mentor conversation, you know, uh, entrepreneurial conversation is going to be a person of color so that I'm going to make sure that I'm prioritizing representation and those opportunities. But I also want them to hear from people that inspire them in view of the things that are they're passionate about. So I'm regularly just, you know, they, they want to know about financial advocacy. You know, what does it look like for them to think about how to save? So there's a woman who started a financial mentoring program in bed -Stuy. She came and spoke to my students. Um, some, some of them wanted to know about criminal justice reform. So we, we connected with the DA, Brooklyn DA's office. We're hoping to have Sadiq Bay. Some of you will know Sadiq 
come and speak to the students about the work that he does around you, you know, alternatives to incarceration. And so they want to know about that. How did he get involved in legal, you know, in the legal before, you know, like on the front end about so, but I'm regularly where I'm polling my students. What are the things you're passionate about, concerned about? Some of them wanted to know about education. How is education rolling out? What reform is happening? So Kamar Kamar Samuels, who's the CEC 13 representative. Um, he's scheduled for a conversation with my students to hear about, you know, equity in education because that, that's important to them. And then talking to them also about, like, how did he get into that? So not just connected to his work, but how did he get into that? But it's being dictated by them telling me who are the people you want to hear from? What are the what are your interests? You know, and how can we connect particularly people of color that are working in those fields to talk to you about these things? Okay, right, thank you, Zach. I'm going to now look. Many members actually join in too. I still have more questions for you. Yep. I want them to ask questions if they have any. Yep. Any questions from Pity? Yes, Ms. Ihorn. Hey, Zach. So you mentioned it's a new program. Um, so, like, what are your goals for the program over the next year or so? Uh, well, again, um, th the goal would be to try and figure out how to do better outreach. So, outreach largely. Pre COVID was I was attending community board meetings. Most of it because I focus on public housing was actually going to TA meetings, right? So I'd be at the Ingersoll meeting, the Whitman meeting, the Farragut meeting, and then other whatever other public housing ones. None of those meetings are happening right now. So an, a recircling around what what outreach could look like to build build on it. Um, a, a medium term goal is I would actually like to through organizations like Empower and other mentoring, like you know. Um, second tier, you know, graduation program, 18 to 25. I'd love to hire one of my students who's been through my program to help with some of the mentorship and leadership. I believe in really empowering the students to take on the responsibility. So that'd be a medium term goal. I've got a few students in mind right now that have been with me for a number of years and are un kind of unsure of their um, education future still. Um, and then it's inviting more partners, right? So we have to build capacity to invite more partners to build on, you know, whether that's um, stipending folks to help with mentorship or um, increasing the the stipend for students. Right now, they get paid fifty dollars for every report, which is about they're getting paid about twenty dollars an hour, roughly, to do that work. Um, I'd like to up that, you know, because I think they're doing really valuable work. If you read any of the stuff, they're just really giving serious thought to the things they're learning about. Um, so those would be some of the things. Um, that we're thinking about over the next year, but it's I mean it's it's kind of tough because in view of COVID. Um, out, outreach is the most important part. Um, we're ha word of mouth is the strength of it right now. It's students who have been through it with me for three or four months who say, can I invite my friend? That's where most of my growth has happened over the last six months to a year, which is great. I'm, that's a beautiful expression of them seeing the value in it. But I want to be purposeful in the out outreach, you know, visible opportunity to in invite others in. So. Some of that is a little bit dictated July 1st, or is that we're thinking full opening? So but we'll see. By by outreach, you mean to other students to participate in the program as well as individuals to support the work that you're doing with the students, or is there, is there one yep. type of outreach? Okay. Yeah. And I'm always thinking about, you know, so I'm I'm polling the students. We meet once a week when I'm at it's just a check-in that we do. And then I'm inviting some mentors to come in and talk about the things that matter to them. And so I'm always doing that. And so I'm always thinking six months out, both for the organizations that I'm asking to come in to have those conversations with my students. Um, and then outreach another level related is like schools. So doing outreach to schools, we have a connection with uh, Brooklyn Prospect Charter, uh, with Brooklyn Tech, Brooklyn Tech right now, um, BCS, which is where my my daughter goes at least for now, because um, she's graduating, going to high school, and I have no idea where she'll wind up. Um, so. Um, Doing some more of that work outreach to students, because we I've, I'm connected to those 2 schools specifically through their mentorship. Um, internship opportunities, and so I'm able to um, absorb, take on some students connect because of those opportunities. So more outreach to schools too, recognizing that um, that sort of opportunity will open itself up again. Because I could go to a social studies class or a mentorship or an internship program meeting more easily pre-COVID. And some of that some of that stuff's a little difficult to get into right now. So. Okay, um, I don't believe there's any other questions from committee members. Okay, that's just the last thing, question thank there. you. Yeah, oh, okay. just thanks. 
Okay, Zach, the last question I'm going to ask you uh, is how can we help you out? Because I noticed there's three points that you were mentioning. Uh, basically, it was uh, partner, partnering with local organizations, providing paid opportunities, and providing employment placement. Yep. How can we help you out with those items? Yeah, so I talked a little bit with Lenny um, after the last call, and or last general call. And so I'm working on some outreach materials specifically to tailor that can be pinned on, you know, the email that goes out from community board too, but also just to get to either of you, if you have your own communication methods with groups that you meet, meet and reach. Um, so as an example, again, there's the open streets, right? So there's these people that are going to be looking after opening and closing the streets and the, you know, the, um, Markers and closing things. So I reached out to one of them and I'm a conversation. I think it's South Portland somewhere. I don't remember exactly what street. Um, but I, you know, I welcome those connections. So leveraging connections like, okay, there's going to be this uh, community, you know, a job fair, you know, it was mentioned already, like a job fair. And so there's going to be need to set up tables and, you know, whatever those things. So I'm working right now on the outreach materials. So that when you, when community organizations are thinking about the meetings and the plans and these um, events that they just keep in mind that there are students that could be potentially included to help with setup and tear down or maintenance or whatever those things. So specifically what I'm going to do over the next couple of weeks is make sure that you have that clear one pager to sort of give a vision to what sort of opportunities are available. Because a lot of businesses, again, are going to say, I just don't have the money. I don't have the space to hire someone. And I totally understand that. But it's thinking about those other things. So I'm I'm open to suggestions about where and how that communication can happen. But I want to get it to you all specifically so that as you're thinking about the spaces that you're in, you know, the, the, the things that are happening in our community board, that people know that, you know, if it's manpower and you have someone that can just supervise a young person for a couple of hours, that this is an opportunity for them. So. Great, thank you. Uh, you've already reached out to Lenny, so I guess that's already covered. Okay, yeah. he'll get back to us as things develop. Mm -hmm. uh, Zach, thank you very much. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you very much for appearing in our, our committee to actually give that information. Thank you. Yeah, much. definitely. And Lisa, I'll be reaching out to you definitely. For sure. Okay, and Zach, if you want to, please post anything you'd like to uh, in the chat so that we can actually get in touch with you if anyone's interested. Because yep. don't forget, this is recorded. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes. with that, okay, we're now going to uh, the chairperson's report. Uh, before I get into my chairperson report, I'm just going to uh, reach out to uh, both Jessica, Catherine, and also Lindsay. Are there any updates that you guys want to uh, comment on to the committee? Hey, Bill. Um, so we were hoping, I know that last session we had talked a little bit about the timeline for um the statement of needs and um, budget proposals but i was hoping that taya could review the timeline with everyone and then we could talk about um what we're looking for from our committee members in terms of support um to get it ready for next year uh as a matter of fact Taya and i were both discussing this and taya has gone ahead and actually has put together exactly what you're asking for and later on we will actually see that taya taya's taya's on the ball <laughs> she knows I mean, exactly what we need Okay. Yeah, you're very, very quickly becoming near and dear to my heart. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, and then okay. maybe after she reviews the timeline, maybe I could take my my minute to speak to it then. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I've already tried to bribe her with a birthday gift. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I'm getting the sense that bribes aren't necessary. <laughs> <laughs> strong, strong suspicion. No bribe needed. Yeah. Okay, uh, Catherine, do you have anything to add? No, that's perfect. We can we can tag in once we open up the timeline. Okay, excellent. Uh, Jessica, are you still there? Yep, all good here. All good there. Okay, Jessica. Okay, uh, with that then, uh, let's see now. Let's go on. Oh, the one thing I do want to say is there's some things that have been going on obviously uh, throughout the district. As things develop, I'll let you know. But currently, I have quite a few meetings that are scheduled for me to attend throughout the, with the bids and other entities throughout here. As this occurs, I'll uh, actually send you send the send to the board office uh, any uh, notes that I have so they can be distributed to the committee itself. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, right now with what's going on in Brooklyn Navy Yard as far as the resource uh, and job fair, currently right now. We haven't got a response back, uh, and I believe 
what we're going to do is I'm going to officially say we're going to put this off till September. Okay, because we we haven't got a feedback and within a month to try to put this together is too short a time. So I'm going to put this off till September and I will be getting in touch with all the people involved and uh, basically see what we can get done between now and June. Okay, to find out about September so we can actually start organizing this over the summer. Okay. So that's where we are with that. Um, Taya, okay, I will now turn it over to you. Okay, for the uh, the of uh, the worksheet that you're talking about. Amazing. I walk people through this process all the time, and then I have to figure out how to share content. And I got a green trees. There we go. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so you'll notice, and please, uh, if you'd like a local copy to look at larger on your own um, device, uh, please check your email. I emailed a link to this if you need to see it larger. Um, let's review the tabs across the bottom. So the reason I didn't share this earlier is I was actually hoping to have more of this timeline available, um, but we're sort of um, at the mercy of the city agencies releasing information. and. They tend to do that later in the year. So what we do know, here's what we know. In May and June, we have an opportunity for community brainstorming. This month, um, as we discussed last month, we can do a review of the past speakers, the topics, the hot button issues. Luckily, we just have had so many of our bid community partners come and speak to us. Um, next month would be between tonight and next month's meeting would be a great time. Um, time to do some early drafting of the requests and to figure out what data requests and sort of research questions we might have because the office can work on those things in the subsequent two months when the committee meetings are on recess. Um, we can do the research, the data sharing, the coalition building and the prep for the public survey launch because in September, early September, we can do a public survey. It sounds like the community board doesn't have um, an extensive recent history of doing this. Luckily, we have lots of tools at our disposal. We had a test run last year because you all um, did your own internal community board survey to prioritize. So we want to do a version of that for the public. Um, we think that's going to be a really powerful uh, outreach tool. Um, Yes, we have laid some groundwork on all of our social media channels. You're going to see a lot more activity on that this summer, and a lot of that is going to be aimed at that public survey. We know that in late September, by the time all of the committees have had their first meeting after summer recess, we should have some committee drafts finalized. Um, late September, we can publish those public survey results in advance of a public hearing in earliest October because early October, we do the board voting that you did last year and the prioritization exercise after the public hearing and public survey um, input is in. And then the final document is edited. This part is familiar to you all from years past. And typically um, the final version is due to the Office of City Planning around Halloween. Sometimes they give us grace period. We try to aim for Halloween. Um, and then November, December, we just start all over again. So the empty spaces that we're seeing here, you're going to see some more dates filtered in here as we get the info. What we know is definitely coming as opportunities for consultations with city agencies, uh, where we can get really specific about budget questions, really specific about what is likely given the current state of city funding, et cetera. We will share those dates and those invitations as soon as we get them. Um, just be forewarned that we often don't get very much advance notice on those ourselves. The reason I have put links to the working committee's pages on the website. So uh, the staff sometimes forgets because we work across all six of the working committees that your view is a little bit more narrow. So we invite you to just be reminded about what the other five committees, what their topic focus is, be really familiar with who the folks are on those committees, um, because we want to encourage a lot more cross committee interaction in the drafting of the requests this year. We think 
there's so much expertise across the committees and it's all kind of siloed. So we're going to, the office is working on ways to sort of break down those silo walls. Um, the other reason these are here is because um, we'd like to share this worksheet with targeted community partners. So for this committee, the obvious choice would be sharing this worksheet out with each of the representatives from the bids that came and spoke to us, right? Um, there's nothing that they can mess up on the sheet that can't be undone. And we just wanna make sure that we have captured their uh, requests correctly, and maybe it will inspire them to add even more requests in the months between now and October. Um, so there's no reason not to have this be slightly more public. We're not gonna open it up to the full public, just to targeted, partner known partners of each committee. Um, the corollary for like um, for Hess might be some of the specific representatives from the hospitals that have come and spoken to them. Uh, Landy's not sure who those partners would be quite yet. Parks and Rec would be the heads of each of the park friends groups. Uh, maybe some of the representatives from the, com the larger community gardens in the district, we have like 13 of them, etc. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to jump all the way to the right side of this set of tabs. Um, there hasn't been any crossover yet between E&E and YECA, the Youth Education and Cultural Affairs. Could still happen. Um, transportation and public safety, there was some crossover. So you'll rec I'll just start with the first one as an example of how this worksheet might work. So I think some of you remember our, uh, the Dumbo bid, I think was one of the earliest speakers spoke about open streets operational challenges and listed some really specific problems. So the problem statement here is open streets operational challenges, there's funding in a challenging year, daily management and staffing, clear regulations, et cetera. The specific location in our district is Dumbo. It's also universal. And maybe there are other specifics we can drill into. Requ all of this needs to be filled in, right? So this is the work of the committee. What is the result that we would like to see related to open streets operational challenges? What is the target date or deadline? And keeping in mind that we're working on FY23. So we gotta be thinking not short-term fixes, but long-term fixes, assuming since open streets is permanent, assuming it continues in, you know, two, two to five years down the road. What is the specific proposal that we'd like to submit as our request related to this topic? Do we know any known or estimated costs? Um, a couple of things that have been tossed around because again, this is not your committee. Um, TNPS has discussed this. Um, I personally actually volunteer on, an on my local open streets. So we should find out what are the known or estimated costs of the stanchions that we get here versus you know, the really fancy ones that you see in the meatpacking district that are like permanent rotating stanchions, right? Um, what is the history of open streets uh, failures and successes over this past year so the request seems really knowledgeable. What is the data that we need to make this case stronger? Uh, who are the collaborators in our district that may be known to the DOT entities or other city agency entities to make this request stronger, right? That's one example from TNPS. Um, similar with parks and recreation, um, I think Wi-Fi and public parks and playgrounds came up. Um, similar in land use, land use has already, um, these are known issues, the site five and the Willoughby square are known issues, both for land use and actually Willoughby square has been discussed in parks and rec as well. Um, Hess has been discussing sanitation service and curb setups. Again, not that this has to stay in Hess or has to be authored by the Hess committee, but they already have expertise on this issue because they've been listening to speakers about this topic this year. So here's you. So there are two sections here. There are four specific requests that um, Chair Flano, you could choose to work on this in process if you wanna do a working meeting, or you could choose to do this between now and the, and the June meeting. It's totally up to you. The, the four things that were squarely in ED&E &E, um, was this funding tied to area median income. This has come up a lot, and it has come up in several other uh, committees probably most often in land use, right? This seems like a great, it came up when the bids came and it's clearly a good issue for this committee to chew on. Um, ongoing COVID related office tenant vacancies are hurting local retail and restaurant recovery. Um, this was an interesting one. 
Local businesses and employees are on the front lines expected to manage any situation that walks through their door. COVID has magnified all of the city's ongoing problems with homelessness, substance abuse, and mental health issues. Meanwhile, the city continues to lack appropriate responses and falls short in providing alternatives to police intervention. This would be a great one to work on with TNPS. However, I think it is a very interesting because it was mentioned by so many bids. I think it is an interesting topic to keep in the economic development uh, committee. And the last one was third party food and retail delivery app fees are gouging local merchants and hurting recovery efforts. Again, really interesting one because I think it's really easy to come up immediately with some really creative fixes for this. Um, so I, I think that there are many proposals that could come out of this. And finally, I just didn't want to delete these items under the gray separator. Uh, they weren't. These were notes. They were not problem statements. They were not requests. I think they were just sort of notes that um, committee members um, of things that you you all had on your mind. So again, just left to right, we're going to start with a need statement because all of those SDNBR requests need a really punchy sort of topic heading, and then a brief description. Right? We need a optimized request. What's the result? When do we want to see it happen? What is our proposed solution? How much is it going to cost the city? And then we need to make the case. What's the history of this topic in our specific district? What is the data that we want to collect to make our request stronger? And who can we put down on record as a potential collaborator to help us either manage any funding that the district should receive or to, because we, we can't do that on our own or uh, to co-produce any programming that might result from these requests. And then there's a section for office notes, which notes, which is basically what other committees are working on these topics. Um, we can figure out which city agencies does the request need to be targeted to, which city agencies do we need to request um, a, consult, a consultation with, um, and then we can figure out whether it's a capital or expense. That's always just a required checkbox on the request form. So that's it. Hey, thank you, Ted. That's a that's very good organization for us to start working with, and we can go from there. Okay, now that um, okay, uh, Catherine and Lindsay, that you've seen this, uh, any comments, feedback? Discussion? Yeah, can we can we ask questions before we talk about what our plans were? <laughs> um, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> um. This is fabulous. This is way more organized than we've ever been. And I, I love everything that you just put in front of us. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, so the, the public survey, and so I guess I'm wondering where the res what's going to happen to the results of that public survey and how they'll then be integrated into what we're doing, because it looks like the timeline of when we need to have it finalized and when those results will be published are at the same time. And so I'm wondering if maybe we can be more specific and make sure that there's some time in between if, if we're expected to incorporate that feedback into our draft. I just want to make sure we even have, even if it's just like 2 weeks to do that. Um, I want to make sure that that time is there. Yep, we are absolutely on the same page, Lindsay. So I think one, not problem, but just um, the situation that we had last year was your survey was so long. I think there ended up being 125 items to vote on. Um, and I think that that was a result of two things. One, we didn't have enough time for the, and you know, this is a process that happens in, in a, at a larger scale in city council as well, right? We didn't have enough time for the committees to sit with that list of 125 and sort of talk to each other and figure out where can some of these requests be combined? Where are some of these requests duplicative? Because you all worked separately. Our hope is that by having a unified worksheet where you can sort of peek into the other committees and see what they're working on, um, you'll we should hopefully end up with a shorter, more powerful list of items to vote on. Where the public survey works into that is all of the public surveying really is gonna happen in September, and you're right. Um, the data crunching, you can leave that to the office. We've got that covered. Um, but we wanna just basically ask the public 
in our geographic district? Where does it hurt? Let them respond in all of their creativity and all of their very strong opinions. The office will work to sort of filter that into the same format as all of your requests. There will be a unified list that is both public requests and board committee generated requests, and you'll be able to vote on those all together in October after the hearing. Okay. And then I think it might be it won't be perfect this year. <laughs> no, it's but it'll be hopefully be better. <laughs> In all seriousness, Taya, every year we get better at this, and yeah. it's only from the institutional memory of the year prior because you don't learn right. what you don't know until it in, until it happens. And also, there's only so much time and effort you can put in each year. So each year we build, and so no one is. This is already leaps and bounds better than anything it, I was it, expecting. It and so continues to yeah. astonish me when I remember that you all only meet ten times a year. Right. Amazing. Totally. Um, and then there's one piece that I think might be missing from the calendar and that yeah. what I view as the last step is advocacy. And so I, I think what we see every year is exactly what we were talking about in the planning together hearing is that we submit this every year. We get the feedback from the agencies and then we don't really feel like it, it goes anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I'd really like to see is that we do some targeted outreach with the. Um, with the items that we're really passionate about as a committee and as a board. And so I, I'm wondering if that could be added to the timeline that once this is completed, we're going to do outreach to our elected officials, to Borough Hall, um, to groups that we have incorporated their feedback into and say, let's do something with this and talk to people who can, who are movers and shakers and really get some of this done for us. Um, I think one of the things that you added is something that I was also looking to do this year was that we need um, budgets for this, but we also need to tie it to policy that already exists. So, for yeah. example, um, the platforms that are taking a percentage of our restaurants um, revenue from doing the takeout, there is currently a policy and the, a bill that was in place that is time bound. Right? And so. One of the things that we might like to see in addition to the to some to a city app that that makes it which you so eloquently had already put in there um, is an extension to the policy. And so maybe we need to to look at this more um, holistically in some select cases and maybe there's some columns there that we can add for either notes or references or associated bills just for people's reference as we begin to research and work on this. So I'm going to respond to the two things separately. I agree. I think the existing bills needs to be done in that research phase where we're gathering information about the history of the topic and the case making section. We'll definitely add that. Um, actually, that's a really good example because um, I think one of the reasons, just in my per, in my own review of previous SDNBRs and the agency responses, I think that. The most common reason that something gets denied is that it's either too broad or too narrow or too short term. And this is the, this is the fiscal year 20 to 2023 requests, right? So you're right. I think it's okay to go broad on this brainstorming worksheet because 1 of the things that we're going to do with all of these added steps is figure out, oh, we. This request isn't appropriate because it's going to be solved one way or the other before FY23 kicks in. Okay. Um, ah, the first half. So I had mentioned the thing that was missing um, are those um, agency consultations. Um, it is my understanding that board members can be invited to those agency consultations, and I don't believe you traditionally have been. So let's do that this year. Again, the problem is that we don't get very much notice um, about when those are going to occur, but we can certainly um, do the communication task of at least giving you the grace of letting you know when it's happening. Um, we should be careful, and it sort of begs the question of maybe we need like sort of a universal budgeting timeline, like a generic budgeting timeline of all the different things in motion, right? Um, Advocacy to Borough Hall 
won't really impact this particular process because these are budget requ these budget requests are going to the a different location. Do you know what I mean? There's a diff a whole different system, an entirely different process where community boards can appeal to the borough presidents for specific capital expenses, and that just it ha it's offset by a couple of months. So maybe we need a universal timeline. Not talking about all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then just so you know, the meatpacking bullards were funded by the bid there. So yes. they, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw them post about it, but that's that's a really good point that the equity. They're really nice. system, they're so nice, but there's they're no flower equity. Plant or them. Um, yeah. Um, it, it is about um the median income of a zip code just because of how the bid is funded, right? Like if the shops have and the bids are more powerful and have more money, then they're able to support a program that the city hasn't fully funded. Right. Yeah. Okay, Lindsay, um uh, I'm gonna let other committee members <laughs> if they have any questions or comments to jump in. Okay. Well, I'm I'm just to, I'll just jump in real, real quick, Bill, just to say, okay. I mean, more of the same, this document is such an awesome structure for us to dive into. And I think even if we're adding columns, like what Lindsay's saying with advocacy and with, with pending policy, I think those are awesome additions. Just having this structure is so helpful. And I think if, especially the coordination between committee, like you're saying the duplication of how overlapping these things are can can um, make it so much less effective. So to break it out into four for us and for us to be able to kind of run with those um, in a deeper way is, is really helpful. And we can, Lindsay and I can work on those and work on grabbing help with those from the rest of the committee to the extent people would like to to jump in with us on it. Um, but we can we can talk more about that, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was about to ask uh, if no more questions or or uh, comments are going to be made. I'm going to start. Oh, yes, Denise. Um, I just have a question for Taya. Are we at that point? Not as it relates to what she just presented, but uh, just a general question. Oh, by all means. So I was just curious um, to know if it's not it's for Taya in terms of coming from the board as a representative of the board office. Uh, oftentimes I see the mayor uh, advertises, or if you look at New York one, there's this information that comes on the bottom that sometimes it talks about jobs. Wait one second. So, uh, for example, I saw on TV that uh, there is some big hiring going on. I think for uh, cleaners or cleaning workers or something. And sometimes I'll get a call and sometimes I'm just curious as to whether or not we, in terms of a community board too, as one of the community boards receive more specific information because it, it almost seems that it never comes with any information. It just says, this is what's going on, you know, or if it's an 800 number and then there's people try to navigate and get, and it, it's just, it just goes nowhere. And so I was just wondering, does the community board office receive any more detailed information when something like that is, is, is presented that we can, you know, share with the community in different ways, not just whether it should be on an email, but just some other, some other ways that we can share that information. If in fact it comes to us in more detail than what they you know, span across on New York one on the bottom. Sure. Um, we are sort of a fire hose of information over here. Uh, we have started tracking in the monthly district office reports uh, how many uh, city agency notices we receive because it is considerable. And I just want to share one thing with you, share a couple items from our most recent uh, Friday emails. So on Fridays, so start. I think we started at the top of this year. Uh, we started 
compiling um, sort of a, a Friday roundup email. Um, these have actually become our most popular emails, like twice as popular as any of our regular emails. Um, and we're able, we have a, some limited data on um, click through rates. So let me just run you through the basic headers that are always in this email. We've always got district news, which is hyper local stuff that's coming up in the next two weeks. Um, at the bottom of this section, you'll see this is pretty new. This was just, at, we just started adding this about a month ago. Uh, we now put, so we, I'll just read this. We've received hundreds of notices every month okay. from the different municipal agencies okay. regarding construction, okay. filming, street closures, neighborhood matters, and yes, jobs. Um, these items are now posted in a district notices folder of our public drive. We've just started dumping them there because the wonderful thing about Google Drive is you can just search by keyword. One of the most common uh, just phone calls that we manage at the office every single day is, I live on street X, there's some kind of construction going on. I either want to know more about it or I'm unhappy and I wanna complain about it, can you help me? So we can either direct the constituent to go to this folder or what typically happens is a staff, an office staff member will go into the Google Drive, Google that street and poop. If we have received a notice from a municipal agency about any sort of water cutoff, electrical, blah, 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 anything, it will pop up. So that's where our district notices are going. The next section is the district meetings, which is just us, um, standard meetings. So this is our template for every single notice that goes out has an update about COVID. We keep it up to date and we keep it very short and very sweet and very simple. There are a million places you can go to get information about COVID and vaccinations. Um, we made a policy very early on that we were only going to use a single source of information for that. The second section is local notices. And I was thinking of you here, Denise, because I think you're talking about this, the city cleanup core. Um, so right now there are, I believe 10 city agencies um, participating in this program. It's kind of a, a, a new deal style recovery a uh, program for part-time and seasonal jobs with the city. It's hiring immediately. They have 10,000 things, uh, uh, positions available. Um, the positions that are currently available are seasonal positions with the NYC Department of Environmental Protection and the NYC Department of Parks and Recreation. I would say Parks has done an excellent job of picking out um, those particular city cleanup core positions by category, by season, by whether they're part-time or full-time, et cetera. Um, and we'll just continue, we will keep that at the top of the local notices section and just continue to update the language as we get it. Um, the other local, oh, so this is for next week. The, the thing, starting this Friday, the thing that will be right underneath this is the other major city uh, hiring program right now, which is the NYC Vaccine for All Core. Um, this has been the only other visual in our emails since January. We're, um, that program is going to be wrapping up soon. The hiring process is gonna be wrapping up soon. So we're gonna graduate that to just the local notices section. But again, that's 2000 positions in all boroughs. It's the single source of information for everything related to that. Um, the next section is what is becoming an increasingly long list that we're actually probably going to roll up and put into the drive somewhere because it's just too long to include in every email. But it's basically a list of local resources and it's your one stop shop for everything that the city can provide related to mutual aid, food, housing, health care, COVID crisis counseling, your pets, harassment. Mediating, this is a huge one, mediating um, disputes between neighbors and local establishments, right? Like there, there's so much confusion about the open streets laws, about the fluctuating hours that are allowed for restaurants. This is great. It's a citywide initiative that provides free mediation between residents and local businesses. Um, some data visualization tools, we get lots of requests for this. Um, and just because it's topical this year, um, in the interactive contribution maps and sort of a single source for information about the candidates. We chose this particular one because it's nonpartisan and they update it when a candidate drops out. So it's pretty, it gets shorter every week. Um, so that's, that's just, I just wanted to walk you through what we've been 
including in our just our Friday weekly emails. So thanks for that. So that's that's it is a lot of information. It's it's a wealth of great information. <laughs> so it's much a involved. wealth of great opportunities. But sometimes uh you know whether the some parts of the community sign on to our community board two website where all of this great stuff would be. Um, I suspect some some do and some do not. So whenever I have information about something, I just hit it to the community. If I'm walking, you know, I go over to a couple of the barbershops on Merle Avenue and I and I leave copies, you know, and I make copies at my own expense and leave copies so that I know that people frequent over there and some people or most of them are not likely to go on the community board too to look to see what's under there. So I think we might, uh, you know, and others may do the same thing, you know, if they come upon a place where they know that, you know, if you're connected with the Navy Our Boys and Girls Club, or if you know about them and, you know, that, you know, that something can go to them. So I was just, you know, curious um, as to how we were getting the information. So then I can tune more into our website on a regular basis to get that and to be able to share it. So... Yeah, I and that. Denise, we need to keep talking about this stuff because I, I think I sometimes I'll just randomly ask people like, I just like it. what is the community board? And you know, I like it. maybe three times out of ten you'll get a <laughs> coherent response, right? Um, <laughs> here's a couple of things. We are seriously understaffed right now. That's no secret. Um, that's also not an excuse, but the. It has been interesting to me to see how much progress we've been able to make. We've almost doubled our email list since January. And that's like, that email list has been around for 12 years, right? So there are small sort of A-B experiments that you can do to improve the assets that already exist at no extra cost and no additional staffing. That Friday email is working. It gets way more hits. And like I said, I think our email list is like, you'll have to look in the next, district office report, but it's it's almost doubled. Um, the trick with social media, we are not a sexy topic necessarily. I think we will be because every everything is up for re-election in the next, you know, we're in the middle of a huge election cycle. Um, but just keep in mind that social media has been around for 20 years. Community boards are real late to the game. So in the meantime, that's been 20 years of people forming habits of seeking out information from other social media sites, right? So we're playing catch up. Um, our strategy right now is to just really be connected. As the summer, we're going to be targeting, <laughs> like, we want to make sure that NPower, they have a great social media presence. We want to be friends with them. Like, we want to make sure that, and like, those hub, those social media hubs, are helping amplify our voice because we won't be able to do it on our own. We're playing catch up 20 years too late. Um, this is not my fault. It's not your fault. It's nobody here's fault. It's just that, you know, yeah. we are never, you know, I, I guess we're, we're playing catch up because community boards probably should have had social media at least several years ago. Right. You know, I get it. And, uh, and I, and I, it, it certainly hasn't, it, it certainly has gone to be of notice that something is different now as it relates to to that and um but and how you get people who don't sign on to the community board website that's a whole nother conversation because i'm you know other than have conversations and to keep saying it if you go to other meetings that you, you you know that's not connected to the community board that you say it and so um, but I'm thinking that there is probably a certain part of the district that may do that, but I'm not sure that the people in any great numbers from public housing who need to know that there are 10,000 cleaning worker positions, as an example, are frequent users of community board to website. So I'm just trying to figure out in my mind, and I just keep giving information and information because I just, that's, that's, that's what I like to do. Um, uh, because I think it's important. So I was just curious uh, about that. So I don't have a problem with continuing to go into the into the CB2 
place and drawing down information and you know taking it down to the church at the open door in some copy or taking it or sending it to Emmanuel Baptist Church or posting it you know in a in a supermarket for something I don't have a problem with that but I just you know it is what it is right now and so uh we I think as a community board uh can you know help in 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 some respects by sharing what it is that we do know by going on to their self. So I'm not saying that we're responsible for people who decide to not go onto the website. That's not the conversation. Um, but I think it is our place to be helpful in those Absolutely. environments and in those communities where we know without having to question why, where we know that that is not what's what's happening. Yes, there's, there's a bazillion people on social media and I happen to not be one. I am on no social media. And so uh, I'm sort of, you know, old fashioned or, you know, that, you know, I'm just not into the social media piece because it's, it's a whole lot of this and that. So that's, so, so that was it. So I'm done. I'm, I'm done. Um, so I'm, you know, I appreciate Bill, in, in, Chair Fluna, in your role on the executive committee, you know, you can keep pushing for that, for that full staffing component too. Uh, Denise mentioned churches, which is just one very small component of the last example I'll give you. So uh, a thing that we actually, Gustav and I were working on last summer before things really got crazy. Um, we actually started making, we, there are databases available on the public drive that we're slowly building because we know it's our job to go to meet people where they are. And they're, you're right, they're not all on social media. So we've started making databases of categories of things in our district. Mm -hmm. One of them is churches and houses of worship, right? So when staffing is back to normal, when community board budgets are back to normal, mm -hmm. when we have access to our postal services regularly again, um, one thing we should obviously be doing is sending mailings to all of our houses of worship, right? Mm -hmm. That's definitely, that's a, that's a I think that's task. perfect because yeah, there, they reach a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, they, they and have in the meantime, we are getting ready. So we don't have the staffing or the financial resources to do it right now, but we're getting ready. Of course. And like yes. making sure we've got all of the houses of worship listed. We've got their mailing addresses. We know who to contact at the office, right? So we'll be ready. Okay, perfect. Let's get back on point. <laughs> yeah, right. We wandered. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So let's get back to um, the issue that we are currently talking about. And by the way, Denise, uh, that is something that we will always be looking at, getting the information out. That is important because all this information comes to us, but then it dies. We need to get it out from here. So that's something that I definitely want to occur as quickly as possible because, you know, it's timely. Okay. It doesn't help anyone to find out about a job three weeks after the, the actual uh, offer was put out there. It doesn't help at all. Okay, so let's go on. Lindsay, I see your hand raised. I'm um, assuming that it's raised for a reason. Yeah, I had two things. Um, one was that we didn't quite, we asked questions of Taya about the statement of needs, um, but we didn't talk about the things that um, Catherine and I have discussed in terms of timeline and, and next steps. Um, so I'm wondering mm -hmm. if we can take a second to do that. Um, yes, by all means. That's why I want to get back to Okay, so um, based on the timeline that Taya has given us, um, I know that it's probably pretty unrealistic to expect people to work on this all summer. Um, but Catherine and I will spend some time <laughs> um, working um, on this over the summer. And so I, I'd like to talk about what the schedule should be for next fall. And so I'm thinking that prior to our first meeting, um, we should be sending out the template that Taya has so graciously put together for everyone with as much work as Catherine and I get to over the summer. Um, and then plan for the second meeting to be to discuss that. Um, so I, I, I don't think we should plan for discussion that first meeting because I think some people get all their information about the community board through the emails, but a lot of people, unfortunately, um, get their information once we start talking about it. And so I think we're gonna have to prompt everyone um, to really take that month, that first month, um, to give us more information. Um, and I know it's probably a slower timeline that we would like, but um, I think we need to give people that month. Um, if, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. Now, Liz, let me ask you a question. When you say people, are you talking about the uh, other 
uh, committees? The board? I'm talking about our committee. So I, I think that that first meeting in September, we have to tell people that this is their last, their first, their, they'll consider it their first, but it will be their last chance to give us feedback um, and to give us items. And then in October, that first meeting, um, we're going to have to go over everything that people have given us and vote as a committee. Um, does that okay, fit? So, so, yeah, so that basically that's going to be the entire, entire meeting then. This, the second meeting of the year, so yes. October. So in September, it's just an announcement and answering any questions. And then in October, it would be reviewing all the work that that anyone else has given us. But Catherine and I will be prepared with what we think of as the first draft for to present in the first September meeting. The September meeting, yeah, because I'm looking at the timeline and because we meet so early, okay, and Catherine is so proficient at getting the main, the minutes out, <laughs> okay, we'll be prepared to actually uh, at the public hearing and also the board voting, okay. So we'll already have the information disseminated to the actual board itself. Is that correct, Tia? Yeah, and I'm just putting some extra notes in here. The reason it's tricky, and again, <laughs> Mr. Plonoy, this is why I submitted a formal request. That this entire process, like the whole late October due date, be reevaluated because this doesn't serve schedule of community boards being on summer recess for two months, right? So right. I don't know why this keeps moving over. Lindsay, I just wanted to point out what is fixed. So the problem is that the board voting and prioritization has to happen before the mid month general meeting, which is usually around the 15th of the month, because that's the last opportunity. The general meeting is when. The document is effectively put to bed in October because then we have two weeks to like get it into the portal and submit it. So backing out from that mid October, we, we have to, all of our deadlines have to be backtracked from that mid month general meeting in October. That's the only tricky part. So I, I think that what we have to think of it as is, is that like Catherine and I are doing 90% of the work and that last 10% will happen in the month of September. I, I anticipate that anyone who's going to submit something from our committee will do it in the month of September, but that that won't be the majority of the items created by the committee. Um, I also think we, we have to go over this again. This is a really small showing this, this month, unfortunately, for our committee. And so I think we have to go over this timeline and spreadsheet again next month before we do our break for summer recess, just to, to get maximum outreach to folks this year or this year, this calendar year for the community board before we hit summer recess. Um, and I know it's duplicative a little bit, but I, I just want to give everyone as much opportunity as possible to receive this information because you've done so much work. Um, and Catherine and I also intend to do again, so much work <laughs> um, to get this going. I just want to make sure we give the committee as many opportunities as possible to hear about it and contribute to it. You well, know, I believe Tay has actually emailed this out to everyone also. Well, and I just if we just it today. Yeah, but they should be able to read this between now and next meeting. Okay. Uh, if in fact they do receive it. And also what I want to suggest too is um I don't want you guys doing everything. Okay, because that's just a lot of work. If you want volunteers to help you over the summer, I mean, for instance, you know, I will be available. Okay, so I, and I'm going to put it to you this way. I will be helping you. <laughs> Mr. Flanoy, I also just, yes. <laughs> just to throw this out there, you don't, you have some ideas for speakers for June, but nothing is confirmed at all. Um, so a, a thought is that June could actually be a working meeting. Uh, let's play it by ear because uh, we have to talk, you know, my, the two of us. So let's talk first, and then if it becomes a working meeting, it becomes a working meeting. Okay. Okay. I, I do think that's the tactic that some other committees are taking too. Probably will be. Uh, there's a few individuals that we've reached out to. I want to see whether or not they say yes or no. And if they say no, then it's a working committee. <laughs> okay. So we'll work with that. Um, now, uh, if there's anyone that wants to volunteer other than myself, 
Okay. I believe uh, we'll do the outreach now and next month. Okay. Before we go on summer recess. Okay. Um, anything else as far as this work is concerned? Um, so I think I'm going to propose this. This is the first time Catherine's hearing this, but I'm I'm going to propose that we just keep our first Tuesday 6 p.m. meetings for the committee as a working group who are for folks who are going to work on this over the summer. Um, I don't think that's overly burdensome if if we meet twice over the summer um, during the recess during our, during our normally scheduled time, um, and we can of course be as flexible as possible, especially around you know that first Tuesday probably being Fourth of July. Um, <laughs> um, but as much as possible, hopefully we can just meet twice over the summer, um, for us to work on this, um, and review, keep that as a goal so that we keep this work moving forward. Not that a problem. Sounds, as long as the working great. group is less than less than half of the meeting. Okay. The actual committee meeting. Okay. We can do that. And I'll be more than happy to, uh, you know, volunteer my zoom, uh, my zoom meeting, uh, as far as some, so we can meet. So it can actually not be just 45 minutes, but it'll be as long as we need. I was hoping it wouldn't be longer than 45. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> we both know it will be almost three hours. Come on. <laughs> I better take the day off in preparation. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so if anyone wants to join in with this, uh, by all means, I would suggest uh, reach out to Taya, myself, uh, or to well, reach out to Tara and myself, and we'll actually then reach out to uh, between Catherine and Lindsay, okay? Because I want you guys getting personal uh, outreach. You want to keep it uh, under control. Okay, anything else? Okay. I have a thing about social media, but should I save it for other business? <laughs> well, why don't we save that for the next thing, which is other business? <laughs> <laughs> uh, any, does anyone have any other business? Yes, Lindsay. Um, so, Taya, I'm not sure. I know that you know that a lot of us have been wanting to do social media for a very long time, but I'm not sure if you're aware, but there was an actual written proposal about including. Yeah. So, one of the things that we had discussed was a template for folks who are coming to speak to the committee for a post that would be generated following their presentation. Um, and so, it's one of the ways to leverage. Um, their existing social media presence as and so there were very specific items that would have to be included in that um and one of them was their 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 hashtags a photo and links um and some you know some would be mandatory and some would be optional but i think it would take the burden off of the front office to do some of that work um it would also leverage the knowledge of the presenters and their organization in terms of what works for their own social media presence um, and hopefully link to their what you what you mentioned is that they have their own followings that we could then continue to leverage as well. Um, and so I'm wondering if we could continue that conversation, take a look at what that template might look like. Um, I had given a couple of examples in terms of what those posts. I wrote that proposal, by the way, um, but it just in terms of what those posts would look like. Um, I think it's a really important step to alleviate the burden from you guys and again leveraging their their audience. Yeah. So have you have, can you send that there. over? <laughs> yeah. It was That's always exactly a draft I like I it was something I just would like pull out whenever, you know, things were slow, but like the <laughs> the idea being that uh, they also had to present an ask, right? What are they looking for from the people yes. who are viewing this post? Um, and so it's and it it really would help in terms of both directions for us to get them what that ask is, but also for us to leverage their audience and continue to build our social media presence. I also, on that note, I really appreciate this committee asked, like, for example, both of the speakers tonight, what can the community board do for you? What is your ask? Because that is the difference between an action and just being sort of an informational meeting. Yeah, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I, I think we can send me that template or any, any, <laughs> any history on that. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other business? Okay, uh, that now takes us to community forum. Okay, I believe we have, I don't know who M. Stern is. 
uh, M. Stern. Uh, if you have anything you would like to comment on, you have two minutes to do so. To okay, hearing nothing, I will now entertain a motion to, oh, hang on a second, no comments, thank you. Okay, I will now entertain a motion, okay, to adjourn. Do I hear a motion to adjourn or do you want to continue for another hour? <laughs> motion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, very good meeting. Uh, we got a lot accomplished. I'm glad we got a lot of input. Taya, thank you very much for all the, the work that you did to help set this up going forward. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You read our minds. Okay. So that's, that's perfect. Uh, guys, uh, stay safe. Okay. And I will talk to everyone individually because I realized I haven't been contacting you on a regular basis to keep in touch with you as far as progress of the different asks of the committee members we have made. So I will be reaching out to everyone on a little regular basis instead of just at the committee meetings. Okay. Guys, good night. I am starving. Have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> night, everybody.